handoff to John oh. Taylor. Hughes hole. He's at the 30. He's going to go. 10, 5, touchdown. Jonathan Taylor made a man miss the line of scrimmage and then runs it into Pater. And a one-handed INT. Are you kidding me? Kenny Moore. What a play by Naheem Hines. Horseshoe is back, baby. The horseshoe is back. Welcome back to another episode of the Bring the Juice Colts podcast. Well, the draft is very close. A couple weeks away now from the 2021 NFL draft. So with that, I thought I would give my second mock draft. Apologies, it's been a bit since I've given a mock draft here. Just been a lot going on, but Andrew Thompson here with me as well. Again, here, Andrew, I'm excited for this draft, man. It's going to be a lot of fun, going to be a lot of craziness, especially if the things that I predict that are going to happen or the things that I do are going to happen do indeed happen. It's going to be very interesting. Uh, Man, this draft, I just love draft season, man. I don't know about you, but I love, love, love draft season. Oh, I'm right there with you. Um, I'm a draft nerd, as I've mentioned on here probably 100 times over. I am fully invested Hit you know come late February you know early March right 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 in that time slot I am full on draft mode. It is so it's like a it should be like a national holiday, man. I'm convinced at this point because I literally that entire weekend for the last few few years I've just like blocked off Thursday through Saturday where I just sit there and I just watch the draft and I'm like I'm sorry like last year even with like when I was dating someone I was just like. I don't care. I'm watching the draft. <laughs> like, and it just goes to show, like, it's just such a fun event that brings the football community together every single year. And so the Colts have a lot of needs in this draft, Andrew. A lot of needs. Uh, some needs at pretty important positions here. And so I'm gonna start here with round one for me. I actually have the Colts trading back from 21 all the way to 32 with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, with this haul, the Colts do acquire a second round pick, pick number 64 this year, and then an additional third round pick in 2022. And with that 32nd overall pick here, I have the Indianapolis Colts selecting Tevin Jenkins, offensive tackle, Oklahoma State. Thoughts on that? I love it. Tevin Jenkins is just an absolute monster. He was a guy that I mocked. Um, I've had mocked to the Colts for for quite some time. I've had I, I've seen others. Uh, other reporters, co-workers at Stampede Blue have him mocked to the Colts before as well. And, and to do it after dropping all the way to 32 uh, is amazing. To have him there at 32, uh, me personally, I, I had the Colts moving up uh, in my mock draft to, to take Jenkins because I didn't think he'd be there. Uh, but in your case, obviously he was. And for the Colts to, like I said, move back all the way to 32, still get their offensive tackle on the future in Jenkins, pick up an additional second round pick and an additional third is just huge in my opinion, Cody, because think about it. The Colts gave up a 2022 uh, conditional first round pick, excuse me, conditional second round pick for Carson Wentz, Wentz which could uh, turn into a first round pick. So if you uh, indeed lose that first round pick for next year because of Carson Wentz's play, you now have an additional third uh, to go along with you know, the rest of your draft picks. So to me, that's that's a win-win. Hmm. I was genuinely shocked when Tevin Jenkins was still here. It seems like every time there's one player, though, that you're shocked is still available. And I think that just goes to show there's going to be a run on quarterbacks. You think at least three, maybe four here in the top ten. Um, there's going to be maybe a run at, at some wide receivers. And you know, obviously you got those two offensive tackles, you know, Penny Sewell um, and some other guys that you think are maybe going to go a little bit earlier than when the Colts are picking. And so with all these guys that are probably going to go here, I think maybe it pushes one of these guys that you're like a little bit genuinely shocked is still available. And in this case, it was Tevin Jenkins. All right, moving on to pick number 54 in that second round. This one may be a little bit surprising, but I personally, this is my favorite pick because I was shocked again that this guy was still available. Baron Browning, a linebacker, Ohio State. Now, on the surface, I get it. Baron Browning is a linebacker. You don't really feel like you need necessarily a linebacker at this point, but Baron Browning is the best player on the board by far at this point in this draft. And this guy is athletic as all can be. He's explosive. He's a playmaker. He does everything that that Matt Eberflus and Chris Ballard 
from upon their defense. I mean, he's got about everything. He was dominant last year, Andrew, at Ohio State. Like, he was dominant at Ohio State. He's got everything you need. He's explosive. He forces turnovers. He's quick. He's fluid. He's got range. He can cover. He can do about everything you need him to do. Now, obviously, we feel like Bobby Okereke is going to be your Mike linebacker. Darius Leonard, obviously, uh, your will side linebacker, your weak side linebacker there. But Baron Browning can kind of do a little bit of everything. I don't feel like he necessarily needs to be, he, he, you know, he probably would play that stand position. But, you know, let's be real, that stand position, at least in the past with how the Colts have used it, hasn't really seen a ton of snaps. But with him now, I feel like, okay, he can kind of play uh, that Sam linebacker position. He can also rush the passer as well, which we know how much the Colts have struggled off the edge to find some pass rush. I mean, this guy just overall is a player. And believe me, the Colts will find a way to use him and get him on the field. I mean, that's what they were doing with Okariki, his rookie season. They were literally creating a position at Sam linebacker to get him on the field with Walker and with Darius Leonard. I feel like with Baron Browning, the Colts will do the same exact thing. Because outside of those two linebackers, Andrew, with losing Walker to free agency to Cleveland, the Colts kind of have a little bit of question marks. They like some of these guys, but there's a lot of unknown. And with Baron Browning, I feel really good about this. What are your thoughts on this pick? I love it. One of my favorite players in the draft, and similar to you, I was surprised that he was there. Um, 6'3", 240 pounds, just an absolute thumper. A a guy that can, as you said, just has such fluidity, can move sideline to sideline was exceptional at Ohio State last year, just an all-around tremendous, tremendous player. And just to echo what you said, the Colts are absolutely, or they would absolutely find a way to get Baron Browning involved, whether uh, that's at Sam uh, or any other position. Um, And and like you said, he's kind of a two-for-one in terms of his ability to cover uh, and pass coverage and his ability to rush the passer as well. There aren't very many linebackers in the NFL that can do both uh, as well as Baron Browning uh, can in our opinion, and so uh, you, you know, you look at your TJ Watts and your Khalil Max and your Vaughn Millers. I mean, those guys are strictly pass rushers. And you look at uh, your Bobby Wagner's and your Darius Leonard's and uh, others. I mean, they they have the ability to do both, and so uh, that's something that's rare in today's NFL. And, and Baron Browning is, is a tremendous pick. Yeah, like you said, I would he was, but. If he is sitting here, Ballard, no question in my mind, he's taking him. I don't care if he's a linebacker or not. He's taking this guy because he is a playmaker waiting to happen. We know how much the Colts defense prides themselves on creating turnovers. This guy's just a turnover machine right away. Can you imagine him and Darius Leonard on the same defense? I mean, I can't. Like, it's just that would be crazy to me to have that kind of production and those kind of guys. I mean, I feel like they would just feed off each other. You know, when you're like a kid um, and you have that friend. I don't know if you did, but I know I did. You have that friend who you kind of just like people compare to like one of them's gasoline. One of them's like the fire. And you just, you got, you keep on, you know, when you're together, you keep on getting a little bit more rowdy. You keep on feeding off each other. I feel like that's going to be the the case here with Baron Brownie and Darius Leonard. I mean, I can't even imagine what that would look like. That would be a dream come true here in round number two. All right, moving on to round I guess still round number two, pick number 64. I have the Colts actually addressing edge here, getting edge player from Washington, Joe Tryon. Now, this guy overall, he opted out last year, but he has a lot of upside, Andrew. In 2019, he had eight sacks with Washington, was looking really good. He's very explosive. He's quick. He's got good pad level. Um, he has. He's really good at leverage against some of these opponents. You, you know, you see that 2019 film. Uh, you know, a little bit though, uh, of negatives, a little bit undersized for a defensive end, what the Colts would use him at, but I think overall he really would be a good NFL, you know, guy right away that I feel like could really help this pass rush quite a lot. And if he's still here at pick number 64, you know, you had it in your mock draft, you had the Colts taking an edge guy there. I think it'd be a really good find here for the Colts to get a guy like Tryon who missed a year. But, you know, because he missed a year, it might have pushed him down from maybe he's a first round talent if he does stay this last year and he does play. So for that reason, I feel like the Colts could potentially be getting a steal here at pick number 64. Totally agree, Cody. I think Tryon uh, is another one of my favorite players in the draft. To me, I thought he was more of a late first, early second round pick. And obviously that's where you have him going here at number 64. Um, Just tremendous value. 
uh, for a guy like Tryon, as you mentioned, eight sacks last year, 27 solo tackles. I mean, just an all around tremendous, tremendous player with huge upside. And we know how much Chris Dodd and Frank Reich and this entire Colts coaching staff values a player with upside. Uh, and you certainly get that in Tryon. And so t- to me, it's a, it's a tremendous value pick. It addresses a major, major need. Uh, and again, it's Chris Ballard investing yet another early selection on an edge player. Mm. I mean, have you noticed something here, uh, this trend with what Chris Ballard is doing in this draft? It's it's completely what he always does, right? You get a offensive tackle. You get a linebacker who can also rush the passer. You get an edge guy. Then with my next pick, you get another defensive lineman in Bobby Brown, defensive tackle from Texas A&M. He'd be kind of your backup three technique. I feel like it's a bigger need than people are talking about, Andrew, especially with the Nico Watry leaving in free agency. I mean, we saw it last year when when DeForest Buckner missed the game due to COVID and all that stuff. What happened? Derrick Henry ran, ran right through the Indianapolis Colts defense. He ran right through the heart of that defensive line. They had no answers for him. A guy like Bobby Brown's got the typical size. He's got explosiveness. He's got good fundamentals. Uh, I really like him a lot here, and I think it's a really nice value find here with this pick. Um, he's a very tough guy. He's very aggressive. You know, we know Matt Iberflus' system is based off of what? Aggressiveness, right? Off of not taking snaps off, off going off every single play. You know, we know how much the famous loaf thing is with this Colts defense and with Matt Iberflus. Getting a guy like Bobby Brown here would have would have Matt Iberflus just licking his chops, man. Already having Baron Browning, or already having an edge guy and try on. Now adding another defensive lineman. Ballard just continues to double down on what has won so far. Another defensive lineman here. What are your thoughts here on Bobby Brown? I love it. I think um, I, I agree with you that it's not talked about enough. Um, you, you know, some people may say, "Well, this is a little high for a defensive tackle," but the explanation you gave is is perfect, Cody. I mean, the way that Derrick Henry just ran through the Colts defense without DeForest Buckner in that home game last season was just, it was hard to watch. I mean, I had to turn the yeah. TV off at one point because it was like, I, I, I mean, he was just, he couldn't be stopped. He was a locomotive train, just absolutely rolling his way through the defense. And you had Grover Stewart and you had Danico Autry and Taylor Stallworth, excuse me, I was drawing a blank on his name, that filled in that game uh, for Buckner. And it just, it, it wasn't the same. It wasn't the yeah. same. And, and so Bobby Brown, I think has a chance to come in and compete not only for a backup roster spot at three tech, but to potentially, uh, you know, divorce Buckner can't play every single snap. I mean, he played a large majority of them obviously last season, but you know, when he's going to get tired and, and when he does, you have a guy like Bobby Brown, who I think similar to what you said, will have Matt Eberflus just, um, you know, look, exuberant, happy. I mean, giddy. I mean, I think, as you mentioned, he is just, I think going to potentially fall in love with, with your last couple of selections and Baron Browning and Bobby Brown. I mean, guys that'll come in and I think um, just be instant impact players uh, to a degree for this Colts defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I, I I love this so far. I love this all the Colts continuing to get their defensive and offensive lines where they need to be to compete. I mean, this is what we've seen how many times now? When you have a dominant offensive and defensive line, it's going to take you places. Now, obviously, quarterback is probably the most important position. But we even saw, Andrew, in that Super Bowl, what happens if you don't have protection? And then on the flip side, what happens if you can get to the quarterback consistently? What happens? What happened to the Bucs? Did they win because Tom Brady threw for 400 yards? No, they didn't. They won because they got to Patrick Mahomes and because they protected Brady well and they ran the football. And that's exactly what the Colts are wanting to do. And this this just this draft is so Ballard like again to continue to add to the trenches. All right, let's move on now to pick one sixty five. Okay, I don't have an offensive or defensive lineman. I have a tight end. The Colts selecting Quentin Morris out of Bowling Green. Now this guy, you know, the Colts have been rumored to be looking for a pass catching type of tight end. Now I think obviously here in round number five. You know, if you did draft him, you wouldn't think this would be the answer, right? You think this would just be another piece to the puzzle. So I think the Colts would have to go maybe trade a later round pick or just wait for Zach Ertz to be released and get him on the roster and just add another piece here with Quentin Morris because, you know, he's really a, a pretty fluid route runner, a p- pretty fluid athlete as a receiver. Um, his only biggest knock, I guess, is his run blocking. And, you know, we know the Colts 
have had a pretty good history, at least, of when guys, especially like Eric Ebron, when he he we know he wasn't a good blocker. The Colts typically, unless they kind of were backed in a corner when Jack Doyle went down, they didn't really ask him to do things that he wasn't good at. And so I feel like it's just another weapon for Carson Wentz potentially to to continue to add to this tight end group that, you know, they have some solid pieces, but they don't really have that receiving threat tight end. Now, if you brought in Zach Ertz, that'd be a different story. But adding a guy like Quentin Morris here in round number five, I think it just makes sense for what this Colts offense wants to do. I mean, you know, they they feel, feel pretty decent about the wide receivers they have right now. But without bringing back Trey Burton, I think this is a need to just add to tight end. What are your thoughts, Andrew? Totally agree. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger need than I think – uh, people are talking about, uh, and some people, maybe not all, but some. Um, the Colts, uh, as I mentioned in, in my mock draft, are in need of a playmaking tight end. And, and I'd like Morris. Uh, I like his upside. Wasn't really productive these last few seasons at Bowling Green. But nonetheless, um, I think he's a guy that can come in. And if there's anybody that can scheme tight ends open, it's Frank Reich. It's Marcus Brady. It was Nick Sirianni when he was here as the offensive coordinator. We know how much success the Colts have had and how much their offense is predicated on the explosiveness and playmaking ability of their tight ends. And I think when you have Jack Doyle and you have Moelle Cox and now Trey Burton is gone, as you mentioned, you have to fill that void somehow, whether it's by way of draft or through free agency and adding a Zach Ertz. They don't have that right now. So to me, Morris is a, is a tight end that I like, uh, has decent upside in my opinion. I don't know if he's going to come in and make an immediate impact right away, uh, but nonetheless, it's a good selection here in my opinion. I kind of look at it like with just how late this pick is, I kind of think you could do a little bit of both. You could go after Zach Ertz and you could still draft him, continue to try to add the talent to, to tight end in the receiving game. All right, moving on now to my next pick here. I have the Indianapolis Colts at pick 206, selecting wide receiver Frank Darby from Arizona State. Now, a little bit about Darby. He struggled with some injuries the last couple of years. He's kind of been behind the shadow of a Nikhil Harry, Brandon Ayuk, to name a few guys that he's played with the last few years. Uh, but I think he's really uh, – I, li- I like him overall. I think he has uh, – he, he really has good hands. Like, he, he, he makes some really tough catches. And uh, I think he has some really good coordination as well. Um, you know, I think he does a really good job of, of using his frame – to kind of ward off defenders a little bit. He's, he's, you don't have to worry about that with him. Uh, you know, overall, I feel like just because he played behind some of these guys that were, you know, early round selection doesn't mean he's not a good player. I just think, you know, with the injury, with everything going on, with, with you know, all that stuff, I think overall at this point, this is where the Colts like to take some project guys, right? And with him, he's got everything you're looking for in terms of size, in terms of pass catching skills, I think he's a little bit faster given his size as well. And I so I think that could translate well to the NFL level. But again, this is the guy that you're taking a little bit later. So don't think he's going to come in and make an impact here on day one. Maybe similar to the Desmond Patman pick a year ago where you like the physical traits from him. But overall, you're just waiting to see. And he'll probably be a practice squad player. But you're continuing to add to your wide receiver group and continuing to see what you got. Because let's be real, T.Y. Hilton may only be here for another year. You don't know what you have in Paris Campbell. So I think it's a good idea to to start kind of getting these guys acclimated to the NFL level and get them ready because who knows what's going to happen next year, right? Maybe one of these guys comes up and because they had a year to kind of learn the offense, had a year to kind of just sit there, kind of like Desmond Patman did, maybe they come in and they're a really dominant receiver. I don't know, uh, but I think right now, given the Colts kind of question marks at the future at wide receiver, it wouldn't be a, a bad thing for them to pick a wide receiver here at pick 206. I mean, you said it best, Cody. I mean, it, the Colts have so many uncertainties of wide receiver, and, and let me explain what I mean. T.Y. Hilton is on a one-year deal. Paris Campbell has battled injury after injury by no fault of his own. Um, God bless him, and I sincerely mean that because, I mean, nobody should have to go through the sort of uh, torment and trial that, that he's been through the last several seasons due to just – weird, weird injuries. And then you have Michael Pittman Jr., who you really like and who you expect to take that leap into year two. Um, Zach Paschal is another guy that you really, really like. But, uh, you know, aside from those four guys, you don't really have any true answers. And I know the receiver um, that you have going here is a later round pick. But nonetheless, um, I agree. I think he's got a tremendous upside. 
Uh, I guess most players in later rounds that you would expect to have some sort of upside. And I think if there's any coaching staff in the NFL, in my opinion, Cody, that can really coach up a, a tight end in the later rounds or a wide receiver in the later rounds, it's the Colts coaching staff. And, and I think that, um, like you said, while he may not come in and make an impact right away, he could certainly potentially be a valuable player for the Colts down the road. Mm. Yep, definitely. All right. So now let's move on. I have two more picks here. Pick 210 here. I have the Colts adding to their corner room, taking corner from Oregon, Thomas Graham. Now, a little bit about Graham. He was a three-year starter at Oregon. He actually was another opt-out in the 2020 season. Um, He's got nice size. He actually, Andrew, interesting enough, showed some potential to be a lockdown corner. Uh, I like this guy from his mindset standpoint. He kind of reminds me of of Isaiah Rogers. He's kind of got that dog mentality a little bit, right? Uh, he, he's not afraid to get in there and, and, you know, break up some plays. He's not afraid to get physical in there. And, uh, he's just a guy that I really like a lot. I like, I like what I saw from him. Um, I think, you know, he's feisty, I guess is the word that I'm looking for, for him. Uh, you know, maybe overall because of his size, he's not the fastest guy in the world. So that's kind of where the comparison ends with Isaiah Rogers. But I think from a mindset standpoint, he's got the size, he's got the mindset, He's got what you're looking for here, especially later in these rounds. I think he's a guy that could potentially be a good steal. Uh, And another guy, just because he didn't play in 2020, he probably falls a lot more than he would normally fall any other given year. Well, absolutely. And I think that to a degree, those are the kind of players that Ballard and and Reich and this Colts staff sort of look for. Guys that maybe didn't play, maybe didn't have the greatest years. I mean, you look at a guy like Julian Blackman, uh, excuse me, who obviously – didn't play prior to being drafted by the Colts because of an injury, but they looked at his tape beforehand. And whether you're out because of an injury or you're out because you opted out um, due to the COVID pandemic, you're obviously still not playing. And so they they looked at Blackman's tape and they obviously liked what they saw, and so they still took him in the third round. And I think similar to the corner that you have going here, um, I I mean, the same thing can be applied to a degree. And and again, I, I think the Colts, you know, don't really have a, a solid solution at corner at the moment. I mean, you have – obviously, you have Rhodes. You have Isaiah Rogers, who you like. You have uh, Rocky Sin, who you really, really hope takes that next step. You have Isaiah Rogers. And then you have a guy that, even though he's going in the seventh round – I mean, we've seen players in the NFL throughout the last 100 years um, and maybe even before – be drafted in the later rounds and, and make a significant, significant impact. And obviously it doesn't happen very often, but every now and then you find that diamond in the rough, if you will. You find that player that, as you said, Cody, drops for whatever reason and some team, team ends up you know, snagging him and he goes on to have a tremendous, tremendous career or, or a very solid career. And I think in this case, adding depth at defensive back where you have some sort of question mark, whether it's Xavier Rhodes' is one-year deal, whether it's inconsistent, he's a rocky sin, uh, the question mark surrounding Marvell Tell and whether or not he's going to be able to play like we saw in 2019 after opting out himself. To me, taking uh, this corner here makes a lot of sense. I forgot to mention also, it's interesting because he kind of reminds me a little bit of Xavier Rhodes in the fact that he's not the fastest guy in the world but he thrives in zone coverage. The same thing is true here with Thomas Graham. Absolutely. You know, to be completely honest, I I didn't really do a ton of film study on Grant, but I I mean, I'm going to take your word for it. I was looking at his draft profile and given the production that he had, uh, not this last season, obviously, but the season before um, I I can understand where you, where you draw that comparison. So it makes a lot of sense to me. All right. So the final pick here is, in my mock draft, pick 248 to have the Indianapolis Colts selecting, going back to edge, selecting Buffalo defender Malcolm Kuntz. Now, Andrew, this is a guy that was a two-year starter with Buffalo, was pretty effective in his time with Buffalo. Um, he's a guy that's a very fluid pass rusher. He's got really good speed, plays really well off the edge in that in that aspect. He's got some bend. He has really good body control. Um, he's got, he's got kind of that nice dog mentality that you're looking for in pass rushers, right? I guess the biggest knock on him, Andrew, is the fact that he, this was kind of what some people were saying. So as a standup linebacker, he's a little bit too slow, but also as a edge guy that you would, you know, in the Colt system, you know, he'd put his hand in the dirt. He's a little bit smaller, but I think that's okay because he's a guy that people forget 
he can add to his frame, right? He can get bigger. He can get stronger. He doesn't necessarily have to come in and be a day one starter. He can be a guy that has those traits that you like, and he can continue to develop them while also getting bigger as a player. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, Chris Ballard and Frank Reich and the entire Colts, Colts coaching staff, pardon me, likes guys with upside. And you know how much Chris Ballard, obviously, it's a cliche at this point, with how much he values players on both the offensive and defensive lines. So you can never uh, go wrong by doubling down on edge like you've done here. Yeah, and that does it for my 2021 Colts mock draft, my second one here. Let me know what you guys think. I had a lot of offensive and defensive linemen, a lot of front seven guys going here. I mean, goodness, Tevin Jenkins, Baron Browning, Joe Tryon, Bobby Brown, and then finally ending with Malcolm Kuntz. And also you acquire a third-round pick from Tampa Bay with that trade in that first round. Let me know what you guys think of my mock draft. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Let me know in the comments below. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. And as always, go Colts. Yeah.